I hope you found the exercise okay. Let's go through now what you should have got. Using the 11 step guide, step one is the design objectives. Well, this is specified as a life safety system to maintain a clear layer height of four meters from the ground, four meters. Now, also of concern, when you're looking at life safety, don't forget is the smoke cannot be over 200 degrees C at that point. So that's the average temperature of smoke can't be over 200 degrees C, which is classified as untenable, i.e. people cannot walk beneath it. So you've also got to maintain the temperature at 200 degrees. So be mindful of that when you come onto your temperature. And that is step one. Now, step two is to determine the design fire size. The formula to determine the fire size based on the information provided is this. QP equals chi times AS times a QF. Where in this case, the QF, QP equals 0.67, which again is the default value for most things give off that same sort of convective heat output. Times three before is 12, times 300, which gives you a design fire size of 2,400 kilowatts or 2.4 megawatts and that covers step two we've worked that out now that covers step two let's move on to step three now step three is determining the mass flow rate of smoke in other words how much smoke is that size fire going to give off in our reservoir in our compartment now we firstly need to establish whether this is a simple plume or a complex plume Remember in the course, a simple plume or a complex plume. Now in this case, the design fire is located in the reservoir where it's going to be extracted, and so it's classified as a simple plume. Now we know that, we need to decide which model to apply. Is it a line plume? Is it a corner plume? Wall plume? Or an axisymmetric plume? You've got to assume worst case. And this is the model which gives the most smoke. Well, this is an axisymmetric. Because it's got air coming in at all angles, this is your worst case scenario for your amount of smoke. And the model we will therefore apply is the axisymmetric plume. So that's what we're going to go for that model. Well, next, we have to decide whether it's classified as a near-field model or a far-field model. Don't forget... If the clear layer height is greater than the longest dimension of the source multiplied by 5, it will be deemed to be a far-field model. If not, it's a near-field model. That's the key. 5 times the longest dimension of the source, which in this case is 3 metres. If that's greater, if the, if the clear layer height is greater than 5 times that, it's a far-field model. In this case, the longest dimension of the source, which is 4 metres, you multiply 5 times 4, you get 20. And this is clearly greater than the clear layer height of 4 metres. Then clearly this is classified as a near-field model. This is the formula you have to apply. M equals CEP times Z to the 1.5, where M is the mass flow rate in kilograms a second. CE is the coefficient of entrainment. P is the perimeter of the source. And Z is the clear layer height in metres. Now we need to establish which coefficient to use in this, because don't forget there's different coefficients. Remember again, if the clear layer height is greater than three times the longest dimension of the source, then you use 0.19, and if it's not, you use 0.21. In this case, it's three times four, which is 12. Clearly this is greater than the clear layer height, and you have to apply 0.21 as the coefficient. So now we've got the coefficient, we've got all the variables. You put them in, you get this, 0.21 times P, which P, the perimeter, which is 4 plus 3 plus 4 plus 3. You multiply that by the height, which is 4 to the power of 1.5, gives you 23.5 kilograms a second. So the mass flow rate of the worst case fire we're going to get in there, the mass flow rate is going to be 23.5 kilograms a second. So that's what we've got to get out of there, out of that area in each reservoir. So, now we know how much smoke is being produced, we need to know how hot it's going to be. Let's move on to step four. Step four is determining the temperature of the smoke. Now, to determine the temperature of the smoke, you use the following formula. Theta equals QP divided by MC, where theta is the increase in temperature. Your QP, don't forget, is your convective heat output. M is your mass flow rate, and C is your specific heat capacity of the smoke. Evaluating this gives you a temperature rise of 101K. 101K. Now, this is hot enough to ensure that the smoke has sufficient buoyancy, but not 
too hot for the life safety requirements. Don't forget, 200 degrees C is the critical temperature for life safety. We know the temperature increase, but how hot is the smoke? Well, you use this formula to work out the temperature of the smoke. TL equals TO plus theta. Your TL is your absolute average temperature, which is what you're trying to work out. TO is the ambient temperature, which generally considered to be 288, and your theta is your temperature increase. Evaluating it out, it gives you smoke temperature of 389K. That's Kelvin. And it's 200 degrees C it's got to be for tenability. So it's way below that. So this is okay. This is tenable. That covers step four. Let's move on to step five, stratification. The phenomena called stratification. Now in this case, because it's got such a low clear layer height, we don't need to carry out the stratification check. So don't forget, you've got to look at it, at least check if it's going to be there. But in this case, we've got such a low clear layer height, we do not have to worry about stratification because it'll never stratify. The smoke will not stratify. So you can ignore it. We move straight on now to step six. We need to know now the reservoirs. How many reservoirs we need? We're trying to work out the ventilation requirements. Like I say, it's natural or mechanical. In this case, we're going to look at, it's already told us we need natural. We need to determine how many reservoirs we need. Well, generally, smoke reservoirs are limited to between 1,000 and 3,000 square metres, depending on the circumstances. And this is to ensure that there is no significant loss of heat. In other words, the actual the smoke will be extracted. Now, the general limit is 2,000 square metres if it's got natural ventilation, and it's 2,600 square metres if it's got mechanical extraction. Now, however, if the primary objective is not not for life safety, but primary for property protection, then the size of the reservoir, whether it's natural or mechanical, can be increased to 3,000 square metres. So if it's purely for life safety, then it's 2,000 and 2,600. If it's for property protection, no life safety implications, you can increase it to 3,000 square metres. Now, another common limit that you've got to make sure you've got to apply with is the maximum length limit. This no dimension should be more than 60 metres, which is measured along the midline of the reservoir. So it can't be more than 60 metres long. In this case, we're going to look at, we've already told us we need natural. We need to determine how many reservoirs we need. Now we know the maximum size of a reservoir in a natural system is 2,000 square metres. And therefore, as you can see here, by the size of the building, we need actually 24 reservoirs. In fact, by careful manipulation of the precise layout, it may be possible to knock it down to 22. But in this case, we're going to stick to 24 for simplicity and symmetry. In other words, it's more complicated. But we will put in 24 reservoirs based on the size, because this is a huge building, 24. We know that now we need to determine the area of ventilation required to extract the amount of smoke that's been produced in each reservoir. So we know how many reservoirs, but in each reservoir, what area of ventilation is required to get all the smoke out that we calculated earlier. And this is termed the AVCV, where AV obviously is the geometric area and CV is the coefficient for that particular type of ventilator. Like I said, we normally express it as AVCV because we're not sure what coefficient we're going to use. By specifying that, the designer will then just look at the coefficient and then they'd specify what size ventilators. So what formula do you use to work out the AVCV? And this is the formula here. Where your M is your mass flow rate, rho zero is your density of ambient air, which is normally taken as 1.2. Your TL is your absolute temperature of the smoke layer. Your AVCV divided by ACI is your ratio of inlets to outlets. Now, in this case, because we've got six reservoirs, you're only going to get a fine in one. You've got one outlet, so you've got one lot going out, but you've got five potential inlets. So in this case, that ratio would be one divided by five. That's your ratio. Then you've got your TO, which is your ambient air, which is 288. Your gravity, 9.81. We know the depth of the smoke layer, and we know the theta. When you put these in, you should get 4.1 square metres per reservoir. That's all you need is 4.1 square metres. Now, in reality, I would like to point out the ratio of outlet area to inlet area might be different to 1 divided by 23, as the system may be so configured that not all the vents are going to open 
on activation of the system. And provided there's plenty of inlet air, however, it will only make a marginal difference to this required area. So it may be different, but it won't make a massive difference as long as you've got plenty of air. Now that covers step six. Now we need to move on to step seven. Step seven, the number of ventilators. Well, we know what total area of ventilation in each reservoir is required. We work that out as 4.1 square metres. Now, this is aerodynamic free area. In other words, you do have to take into account the coefficient of the ventilators. Now, generally, the coefficient applied to most ventilators is 0.6, indicating a 60% efficiency of that ventilator. Now, if you divide 4.1 by 0.6, it gives you 6.83 square metres of geometric area. Do you understand the difference between aerodynamic area and geometric area. So now we need at least 6.83 square metres of geometric area in each reservoir. So next thing we need to consider is how big do ventilators come? Well, they generally come no bigger than 6.25 metres. So we need at least 6.83, which we worked out, divided by 6.25. Really, we need at least two ventilators in each reservoir. That's all we need at the moment. That's the minimum. However, we've got some of these to consider, but that's what we need to meet the area. Now, where do we locate these two ventilators? Well, before you decide this, you've got to carry out the stagnation check, which is step eight. This only applies to natural, but we are going for natural. And what it says is, ventilators can be no more, the maximum distance from the edge of a building to a ventilator is 10 meters, and they can't be more than 20 meters apart. So what do you do then? Well, what you do is you mark a line at 10 metres from the edge, making sure there's no more than 20 metres between them, and you draw a line, as you can see here. Now, that shows you there, where, wherever it intersects, you are going to need a ventilator. So as you can see there, there are six intersections, and you need six ventilators. So although we only need two for size-wise, we need six to meet the stagnation check. So they'll be a lot smaller, but you need at least six located, as you can see here. That's what you need. So, 4.1 square metres we need total. We need at least six ventilators each of 0.68 square metres. So that's what we need. Now, the designer has proposed vents with an area of 1.75 square metres. Now, this is much larger than required size. We just worked it out now. We actually only need 0.68. But it doesn't mean that you can have fewer than six vents, don't forget, because you're putting them in because of the stagnation check. So you do have to have six. Now, you can have six at 1.75 if you want, or you can have six at 0.68. It's up to you, but the designer has specified that. I think the designer would be wise to reconsider the size of the proposed vents. Now, without information to the contrary, though, we shall continue this analysis on the basis that the designer is installing six vents per reservoir, each of 1.75 square metres. That's what we're going to progress on. You've got to carry out the plug hole in check. You've got to make sure that the smoke will not plug hole and cause a vortex, which will induce air and affect the efficiency. Now, you do this for both natural and mechanical ventilation. Now, again, don't forget there's two models which determine if plug hole in is likely to happen, and it depends where the ventilator is. If the ventilator is less than two metres away from the edge of a wall, you use one model, and if it isn't, you use the second model. Well, in this case, it's not within two metres. We use the second model, which is this one here, this M-crit, where the M-crit, obviously, is the maximum flow that can go out of there, the maximum mass flow rate, without plug holing. You've got row zero, which is your ambient density. You've got your acceleration due to gravity. Ambient temperature. We've got the theta in there, which is the increase in temperature. D is your smoke layer depth. And don't forget, you've got your WV factor, which is the width of a circle with the same geometric area as your ventilator. You've got to convert your, your square, whatever it is, whatever shape it is, into a circle to insert in this formula. And to do that, you use this formula here. And as you can see, if you put the numbers in the formula, your AV per vent, it's 1.75, but that's a geometric. You need the aerodynamic area, so you've got to divide it by the coefficient, which has been specified as 0.6, gives you an answer, 1.9. So that's the WV, 1.9. You put all your known variables into the M crit. This is what you should have. And the answer should be the critical exhaust rate is 168 kilograms a second. This is the amount of smoke that can leave one ventilator without the smoke plug hole in. In other words, a vortex forming. 
Now, this is a huge upper limit for the smoke that can leave a single ventilator, and we would expect a high figure such as this where we have a depth of smoke, you know, quite low. Now, the amount of smoke that leaves each ventilator is the total amount that leaves it by all. So what you have to work out now, we're trying to work out, is we know the, the critical exhaust rate. Now we need to know how much is going to come out of each individual vent. Well, we have to divide the total mass flow rate of smoke by how many ventilators we've got. Well, we worked it out. That in this case, it was 23.5 kilograms a second. You divide that by each ventilator, the six ventilators, it comes out at 3.9 kilograms a second. Now, that is considerably less than the critical exhaust rate. So we can be confident that plug holding is definitely, definitely, definitely not going to occur in this case. So six ventilators, each with an aerodynamic free area of 1.75 square metres will be satisfactory. But don't forget, like I say, really, you could make them smaller and still meet their design requirements. So the designer could have used much smaller ventilators, which would obviously be cost saving. Now that completes the plug holding check. Step 10 is to check the air inlet velocity if necessary. Well, that does not apply in natural ventilators and we've also got plenty of air inlet coming from the other reservoirs. So you don't need to carry it out. That's more for when you've got mechanical ventilation and especially in a life safety role. So again, step 10 in this particular case, you can miss. The final check you need to carry out is step 11, which is the post design considerations. And in this case, you would ensure that weather conditions would not have an adverse effect on ventilation and that the pitch of the roof is not greater than 30 degrees. In other words, you've got to look through the wind criteria. You've got to look at your curtain. You make sure your curtains are not going to deflect and you've got to look at tall buildings in that area. They're the sort of things I would expect you to look at in the post design considerations in step 11. And that completes this exercise.